heard the term flat rotation curve and just been totally confused about what that was even referring to. Maybe you've heard that it's a key piece of evidence for dark matter, but you just didn't have any idea how to even interpret that. Or maybe, have you even told someone else that flat rotation curves are a key piece of evidence for dark matter, but not actually known really what that meant or why or how? Not here to judge, just here to explain. I'm Nora and I'm here to be your guide to rotation curves. Today we're going to talk about what a rotation curve even is, how we measure it, and why it's such a compelling piece of evidence for the existence of dark matter in our universe. So what the heck even is a rotation curve? Well, in basic terms, it's literally just a graph, and the x-axis is distance and the y-axis is speed. Now the distance that we're talking about here is typically a radius or a distance from the center of some system of interest. And the speed that we're talking about is rotation speed, which is why this is called a rotation curve. And that is just how fast something is moving around in its orbit. And that's really it. Now when we're talking about rotation curves and dark matter, we're typically talking about rotation curves of galaxies, but you can plot rotation curves of other systems as well. In fact, let's consider our good old solar system to begin with. Now we've had a pretty good idea for centuries how objects or planets orbit in our solar system. This is described by Kepler's laws, which I'm not really going to get into here, but if you're interested, I talked a lot more about Keplerian orbits here, and you can go ahead and check that out. In particular, Kepler's third law tells us what we need to know, and this is the equation for Kepler's third law, but don't worry, I won't ask you to do any math. There's no homework in this video. <laughs> but what this is really showing us is that the time it takes for an object to complete its orbit around the sun, that's its period or P in this equation, has some calculable relation to its distance from the sun, which here is indicated by A for semi-major axis. But if we consider a circular orbit, just to make things a little bit easier, that's the same as R, the radius. Okay, but I said that a rotation curve is speed versus distance, not period versus distance. But luckily it's basically the same thing. We can just calculate that because we know what the circumference of a circle is. It's just two pi r. And so we know the distance that an orbit travels and we know the period, the time it takes to do it. We can just do distance over time that gives us the speed. And because we have this nice beautiful equation from Kepler's third law, we can actually plot at any given distance from the sun what we would expect the rotational speed of an object to be. Now remember the rotation speed we're talking about here is the rotation around the sun, not the planets or objects rotation around its own axis. So we're talking about orbiting, not spinning. <laughs> No, I promise you wouldn't have to do any math, so you don't have to do this, but if you're interested, you can try to do this algebra at home, but I already did it. And if you do the calculation from Kepler's third law, this is the rotation curve that you get for the solar system, a nice theoretical prediction about what the rotation speed should be at any given distance from the sun. And this type of rotation curve is called a Keplerian rotation curve, because again, we've just used Kepler's laws here to come up with this. Okay, so now we have this nice, pretty theoretical rotation curve, but how do we actually measure this out in the real universe? This is actually not that difficult to do for the solar system. So we can measure the periods of the planets and their distance from the sun, and then that can give us this rotation curve. In fact, that's the exact data that Kepler used to come up with his laws in the first place. So we would expect it to match up with the uh, prediction from his laws very well, and of course, it does. And Kepler did not know then why this was the case, but we actually know now that it's because of the force of gravity that leads to this behavior. Okay, that's our own solar system. Obviously, this is going to be a lot more difficult to do for other solar systems. And if you're considering something like a galaxy, the periods involved are thousands to millions of years. So you're not just going to be able to measure a period and a distance and call it a day. <laughs> We wish. Instead, we can actually measure the rotational speed directly using Doppler shift. Doppler shift is the thing that happens when the source of a wave is moving relative to the receiver of a wave, causing the wavelengths to get kind of squished up on one side and stretched out on the other side. And of course, the classic example of this is the sound of an ambulance as it whizzes by you. It kind of changes frequency as it's approaching you and as it's going farther away, and that's from the Doppler shift. And the Doppler effect applies just as much to waves of light as it does to waves of sound. So if we know the wavelength light has when it's not moving, and then we measure that light at a different wavelength, that difference in the wavelengths is the Doppler shift, and that's directly related to its speed. But there's one caveat here, and that is that the Doppler shift can actually only tell us the velocity of something moving towards or away from us, we call the radial velocity, not the velocity of something kind of moving side to side, what we would call the transverse or tangential velocity. So the Doppler shift tells us if something is moving towards or away from us, and that's it. But we can actually use that to our advantage in this case, because we not only want to measure the rotation speed, we also want to measure the distance from the center of the galaxy. Consider the Milky Way, our own galaxy, which is a pretty great place to start if we want to consider this sort of thing. We can think of the Milky Way in a kind of simplified version as just a flat disk with objects 
in circular orbits as we move out from the center of the galaxy. Now this is a simplification, but it's not a terrible one. So when we, on our little circular orbit out here at eight and a half kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy, look down a given line of sight through the galaxy and measure this velocity, this radial velocity, that radial velocity will be maximized where the object is moving entirely either towards or away from us with like no side to side movement. And that will happen at the point that's tangent to a given orbit. And so that is associated with a certain distance away from the center of the galaxy. That's maybe a little bit confusing to wrap your head around, but the idea is that if you're looking down a given line of sight through the galaxy and you measure these radial velocities, you can get both a orbital distance and an associated rotational speed at that point. And those are the two pieces of information we need to make a rotation curve. Fun fact, when I say that we are measuring the speed of objects, you might be thinking of stars because, you know, we have a lot of those in the galaxy and they're very bright and easy to see. And we do use stars for this, particularly in the inner regions of the galaxy. But you don't have to use stars, you can use other objects. And we actually really commonly use clouds of neutral hydrogen to do this because they emit radiation at a very specific wavelength of 21 centimeters and they exist like very far out in the galaxy so we can actually measure this rotational speed out in the outskirts of the galaxy where there's not as many stars and 21 centimeter radiation is actually a radio wavelength which means you can do this with radio telescopes and radio telescopes are really cool because they're not really affected by light pollution or by clouds and I actually did this myself as an undergraduate. It was a lab that we did using just the radio telescope that was mounted on the roof of our physics building it was it was very cool. It was probably definitely the coolest lab I did as an undergrad, and we did successfully measure a rotation curve of the Milky Way. Okay, but undergraduates and lab aside, what do like real actual scientists get when they try and measure this rotation curve for the Milky Way? Well, they get something that looks like this and, you know, can get better at measuring it over time, but it's obvious even from these very early rotation curves that this does not look like that nice, beautiful Keplerian curve we plotted earlier. Now, a galaxy is much more complicated than a solar system. For one thing, basically all of the mass of the solar system is concentrated at the center with the sun, which is 99.86% of the total mass of the solar system. So we can basically ignore all of the rest of the mass of the solar system and just consider the sun. Not the case for galaxies. They have kind of extended mass. And orbits in a galaxy are generally not going to be these perfectly circular Keplerian nice orbits. But in general, if you look at a galaxy, most of the stuff is concentrated towards the center. So it's actually not that bad of an approximation, especially once you move away from the center of the galaxy. Like there's out by us, there's definitely not very much mass compared to the center of the galaxy. And yet the rotation curve looks not at all Keplerian. It, look how flat it is extending out from the center all the way out here. It's not falling off at all. It is so flat. When you get to the outskirts of the galaxy, the measured orbital velocity is over twice what you would expect from Keplerian velocity based on all of the shit that we can see. And the reason that the Keplerian curve falls off like that is because of gravity, because the gravity wanes as you get farther and farther away from the mass that is the source of the gravity. So if the curve isn't falling off, then you're not actually getting any farther away from the mass. And when I say the mass here, what matters is the mass that's basically interior to kind of a spherical shell at a given radius. So in the Keplerian model, basically all the mass is at the center. And so it's already inside your radius at a given R. And as you move farther, you're just getting farther away from the mass. And so your speed is going to go down. So with a flat rotation curve, that must mean when you kind of step outward in radius and you have a bigger spherical shell to consider, you're encompassing more mass. So your velocity is not falling off at all because you're not actually getting farther away from the mass. You're actually just getting more mass, AKA there's a shitload of mass spread throughout the galaxy, not just at the center. And that is the reason that a flat rotation curve is evidence for dark matter because there's mass there to keep these speeds that high and we can't see it. We can't detect it. We just know that it's there because otherwise these orbits would be going way too fast. The galaxy would fly apart. It's just, you need the mass to have orbits like that. Okay, so maybe this is just like our galaxy being weird. Maybe the fact that we're inside the galaxy, we're measuring something wrong. No, it's like every galaxy. In fact, this behavior was not first discovered in the Milky Way and our rotation curve. It was first seen in Andromeda Galaxy's rotation curve and then confirmed in galaxy after galaxy through the 1970s. And all of these flat rotation curves pointed to the existence of a significant large amount of mass that we couldn't see in any other way, but we could see the gravitational effects. 
This new huge body of strong evidence really brought the idea of dark matter, which had first been proposed back in the 1930s by Fritz Zwicky, into the mainstream of astronomy, and we've been trying to understand it ever since. <laughs> so there you have it. The rotation curves of spiral galaxies are flat, not Keplerian, and they indicate a large amount of unseen mass that continues out far beyond the visible concentration of matter that we can actually see in galaxies. We'll end with this caveat. Of course, the reason that Keplerian rotation curves are the way they are is because of gravity. Newtonian gravity, in fact. There's always the possibility that gravity in a galaxy is just not the same as gravity in the solar system. And in fact, we already know, of course, that Newtonian gravity is just an approximation of general relativity. So it's certainly possible to construct a modified theory of gravity that could explain the flat rotation curves without invoking dark matter, instead saying gravity itself is different. However, rotation curves, while they are a very strong piece of evidence for dark matter, are only one piece of evidence, and there are others. So any modified gravity theory that you construct to explain rotation curves has to also be able to explain all of these other pieces of evidence for dark matter. And so far, none of the proposed modified gravity theories have really been able to do that as well as the dark matter theory, and so it is considered the leading theory amongst astronomers and cosmologists. Have a good one. Bye!